We'll go ahead and get started. Good morning again, everyone, and welcome to Eco Questions on this Wildflower Wednesday. Uh, my name is Jenny, and I'm the coordinator for the Metro Phoenix Ecoflora Project. Thank you for joining us. Uh, like I said, please remain muted until it's time uh, for the Q&A session after the presentation, but feel free to type questions in the chat as we go along. Uh, everyone's going to receive this recording in their email, and it will also be posted on our YouTube channel. So for those of you not familiar with the Metro Phoenix Ecoflora, we are community science, uh, community scientists in a community science project that uses iNaturalist to document urban biodiversity. Uh, and we encourage the naturalist community through events like this one. And uh, each month we have a new EcoQuest looking for specific species or ecological relationships. And this session coordinates with the March EcoQuest observing wildflowers and comparing what we find this year uh, to what we saw last year. So we did this EcoQuest last year too. I'll put a link to that EcoQuest in the chat here in a minute. Uh, also put links in the chat for more information about EcoFlora, including our website and newsletter sign up. So in coordination with the March EcoQuest, we have the beloved Steve Jones with us today. Many of you may know Steve from iNaturalist, where he is endlessly gracious with his knowledge and willingness to help others learn more about identifying plants. Steve is an independent botanist in northeastern Maricopa County. He is involved in the Desert Foothills Land Trust and the McDowell, McDowell Sonoran Conservancy, uh, Parsons Field Institute, that is a mouthful, uh, and has worked on documenting the flora and vegetation of the McDowell Sonoran Preserve. Uh, Steve's gonna tell us about common local wildflowers, how to identify them, and what it takes to have a good wildflower season. Put your hands together and welcome Steve. I'll stop sharing my screen here. Steve, I've got you unmuted, and there you go. You should be able to share now. Let me see. Click there. We're going. Okay. Well, let's uh, dive right into the screen here. This is the first time I've done this, so uh, <laughs> bear with. All right. Uh, well, we all ask this time of year. Uh, you know, what's the what's the spring going to bring here? Um, uh, basically, the you know every season we we have that question with ourselves. But I guess the first thing we have to do is trying to find what a wildflower is. And uh, there's really no hard and fast definition beyond it being you know wild, not cultivated. Um, it can be annual or perennial, both. We'll figure that out. You know, it can be whatever. Basically, it boils down to is it an attractive wild, uh, attractive flowers. You know, the people uh, notice it a lot. That's kind of what uh, falls into that category. Anything that's uh, attractive falls into the wildflower category. Most of them are spring ephemerals, um, meaning, you know, a plant that grows in the spring, flowers, reproduces, dies, gets it all done in one season. Um, there's a long list of spring flowering annuals, including uh, some things without attractive flowers. We'll talk, to you, talk about a few of those, like annual grasses, uh, non-native grasses, red brome, Mediterranean grass, things like fillery, cheeseweed, stink net, all those are um, non-natives. We also have some tiny flowered, uh, common, very common, but tiny flowered uh, spring flowers like uh, mustards and cryptanths that, um, they're wild, they're flowers, they're not really considered wildflowers because they're, they're not that showy. Uh, red brome is an interesting one. It uh, is, uh, I used to tell people <laughs> that it came uh, in Father Kino's socks. Uh, that turns out not to be true. Uh, those seeds are, you know, miserable things. The, it turns out that the, it was first collected in, the, in America in uh, uh, Central Valley, California back in the 1840s. So it's probably coincident with probably came in from uh, San Francisco and uh, has, uh, you know, when the, uh, it was, it, like I said, the 1840s, so 160 years or so, it's uh, spread prolifically. It's uh, naturalized here now. It's not an invasive. It's, it, it won the war, as we put it. Uh, it, it the invasion's over. There's another relative of it, uh, Mediterranean grass, schismus. You may know it as. We have mostly one species, Barbados, Schismus Barbatus. Schismus arabicus is around here as well, though I rarely see it. Um, both of them are from the Mediterranean region. Our climate, of course, is very similar to the Mediterranean's climate. So things that do well there do well here. 
and consequently, you know, the other way around too. You know, we got some things here that uh, are problematic in the in the Mediterranean region. Uh, they've had problems with cacti, I believe it or not, prickly pears and things like that. But uh, Australia, I think, had more of a problem with them, them than others. Anyway, so those are the, some of the some of the things we see in the spring, but aren't really wildflowers. Um, I think I went through two. Yeah, here we go. So there's some other non-natives like fillery, which has got a flower and considered a wildflower, I think. Uh, cheeseweed, uh, you know, the uh, uh, Latin name for that is Malva parviflora, small flower. So you don't really see the flower. There's a little tiny white flower down there if you dig under, dig in under the leaves. Uh, then our old friend stink net, uh, recent arrival. The first two I, I would call naturalized as well, like the grasses. Uh, stink net's a current uh, current invasive. <laughs> it's a, the, the invasion is underway, and it's doing very well. Unfortunately, it's got you know hundreds of uh, seeds in those little flowers, and they're very light. They're, there's uh, their net net like material that uh, just catches the wind and blows like dust. And so it's spreading everywhere. I still, I'm finding it on the Tondo National Forest uh, quite a lot, unfortunately. We've got some small flowered spring flowering annuals. Uh, Non-native on the left there is, uh, is London Rocket, just uh, Cisimbria Mirio. I think everybody knows that one. That one is, uh, believe it or not, edible. Um, the uh, leaves are um, sharp mustardy taste. You can eat them. You can put them in a salad even, but uh, a little bit goes a long way. It's pretty sharp. It's a pretty sharp flavor. But uh, if we if we all pitch in, maybe we can get rid of it, right? <laughs> then we have the native uh, native mustard here, uh, um, uh, peppergrass in the middle there. That's got uh, uh, different uh, um, fruit shape there. You'll notice it's got a flat fruit. That's a that's a silical. The ones on the left are silics for you mustard pans. Um, a long skinny fruit is called a silic on uh, mustards and a silical on the, uh, the flat ones are called a silica like that. We also have uh, a lot of cryptants, a lot of native cryptants. They're uh, um, many of them. They're very difficult to identify by, by flower. I, I don't really even try. Um, there's, there's one species, I think, a terracaria, a cryptanth terracaria that you can identify from the other cryptants. But uh, cryptanth literally means hidden flower. So yeah, not much in the way of a wildflower here, but it is a spring flowering annual that we, that we see commonly. There are some spring flowering perennials that are quite showy. Uh, the obvious tax are things like ocotillos and brittle bush, globe mallow, um, tuberosas. I uh, had another list here, where was that? Uh, and golden eye, you know, fairy duster, flowering cacti, things like that, that are perennials that are fairly showy. And we have some others that are not quite so obviously perennial, like blue dicks and fleabane, desert marigold as well. They're uh, not really, um, uh, they are perennial, but we don't see them uh, as uh, uh, during the off season. They only come up during the spring, do their flowering, die back and uh, come back the next year. Desert marigold, not so much. It's a, kind of a short-lived perennial. It doesn't die back to the base and go. It's uh, quite, uh, um, it's always there. We had a really good uh, explosion of that back in 2018. I'll talk about that season later. But I know locally at my place, we've had a lot of those. So there's some of them here. We got Ocotillo, of course, with the red tubular flowers that hummingbirds love. And they're just standing out there. You know, the hummingbirds love it for one thing. They can, they can certainly see there are no predators. Uh, <laughs> they're at the end of that wand. Uh, so that's handy for them. Uh, we have brittle bush, very common, very common, uh, likes disturbed soils. Um, I tell the story of the uh, um, toilet paper fire in the McDowell's, also called the ankle of fire. Uh, back in, gosh, I can't remember when it was, 1990s, uh, there was a surveyor. They were out there looking to uh, um, um, build a check dam along Los, in the Lost Dog Wash area in the McDowell's and Orange. And so the surveyor was out there and he felt the call of nature and answered it and decided he better burn the toilet paper. Well, 250 acres later, <laughs> it burned up a slope and, and what really came back was brittle bush and profusion. It was just a solid yellow hillside in the springtime following that when we had a good rain season. So uh, it, it's a disturbed land plant. It likes disturbed areas, but uh, it's very common in even non-disturbed areas. Uh, globe mallow, is another one, another common one we see. Um, like I said, we've got, you know, golden eye, chuparosa, 
prairie dust and things like that as well that are similar, similar season. They're flowering perennials in the summer, uh, spring. We have some, like I said, not so obvious ones, uh, blue dicks. They uh, stay underground as a stem, a uh, corm, storage tissue underground uh, during the most of the year, but they'll send up their leaves and uh, eventually flowers. This is a nice cluster here. Uh, it is also seen in California. This, this is a this is a subspecies. The subspecies we have is Palsiflorus, which is uh, means uh, fewer flowers. It has fewer flowers in its inflorescence than the than the California subspecies. It's also got that white bract. It's got a light colored bract underneath the inflorescence. If you look at the flowers there, you'll see that white colored bract or light colored bract. The one the California variety is or subspecies. I'm sorry, is is darker. Fleabane, if you see a fleabane in the metro area, it's almost certainly going to be Erigeron divergens. Uh, that's a low, lower elevation, uh, more desert adapted uh, fleabane. Most of the other ones you'll see up high, and there are hundreds of fleabanes in the, <laughs> in the, in the genus uh, Erigeron. But what we're almost certainly going to see in the metro area is going to be Erigeron divergens. Not many other ones uh, come around. Desert marigold, of course, everybody, hopefully everybody knows that one. Uh, there is a relative of it that has uh, wider, shorter ray florets and is otherwise pretty much the same. Uh, it's also spring flowering, but not very common. I, in fact, I've never run across one and known it anyway. We also have some cryptic spring flowering perennials, things that, uh, you, you know, they're, they're wind pollinated in some cases here that uh, they don't produce a, a flower, uh, I mean, a, a, a display flower. They don't attract insects. They don't need to. Mistletoe does attract insects, but it uses smell. It uses a, a, flavor, a smell um, um, uh, scent. Um, if you've ever, in fact, the season is just winding up. If you're ever out and, you know, around a, a mesquite tree or Palo Verde or ironwood or other cat claw, things like that, a bean family tree, you'll see that plant in it. And, and especially in the morning and evening, if you, if you go by and you smell this wonderful, sweet, spicy smell, that's the, that's the uh, mistletoe flowers. Um, this is a dioecious plant, male and female plants on, on the same, you know, male and female flowers on different plants. Uh, the upper one there is the female. You see a little red stigma in that one in the upper, just upper left center there. Uh, below that, you'll see uh, male flowers, which are actually a little bit bigger. These are not the scale. The, the male flowers are a little bit bigger, and they have uh, uh, little anthers you can see in there with pollen. And bees, uh, honeybees are common on it. Bats, little flies, all sorts of creatures that, that uh, um, pollinate it. Season is just ending now, no, but if you smell that smell, that's pretty nice. What happens is the female flowers will, will uh, germinate, uh, will pollinate, I'm sorry, now, and they will wait until this fall, till October, November, before swelling. So what we're seeing now, those fruit that we're seeing were, were last year's flowers. We also have bursages. It's a monoecious plant, male and female flowers, both on the same plant. Female flowers above there, they're kind of lower on the, on the stem below the, the male flowers, which just produce prodigious amounts of pollen and, and hope for the best. Let it, let it out on the wind and hope for the best. Um, jojoba is another wind pollinated species. You can see on the upper right there, the, the female flower with those three stigma produ uh, pro projecting from it. They just hope, you know, the male flowers below there, they'll just release the pollen and hope that a, a grain carries along and catches a stigma. So those are things that are not really wildflowers. Um, some of the climatic factors that we, uh, that we need to produce a, a good wildflower season um, are uh, good germinating rain in October, sometime between October and December. We had a, a pretty good rain in December here, so we have a, a late season. Uh, we started late this year. Rainfall amounting to about an inch is needed for a good germination to, for all the seeds to, uh, to respond. And uh, a good following rain of at least an inch a month is needed to maintain growth. We have not had those. We've had, uh, I think, one good rain since then, two or three months after the December rain. So it's going to be a below normal season, I'd have to say. Um, okay, let's 
go into some of the edaphic factors. The soil chemistry can, uh, can play a part in what's growing where. Carbonate soils are very common around here, caliche, uh, things like, you know, things like that. The, the soil uh, chemistry is, is uh, heavily uh, influenced by uh, calcium carbonate, uh, potassium carbonate, I think potassium carbonate, other carbonate materials that uh, you'll, when you find that soil, you find uh, things like creosote bush, uh, kenosha, the uh, uh, crucifixion corn, um, shrub wise. And then uh, one of the, one of our spring annuals is uh, the uh, ladder pot. And that I find on carbonate soils quite a bit too. So it's, uh, it's very common in, uh, in carbonate soil. The soil seed bank, the soil moisture and texture, I forgot that. Uh, where I live is uh, on the Pinnacle Peak pediment, which is uh, coarse, very coarse soil, takes up water very readily, um, gives it up fairly readily. Uh, most of Phoenix, most of the valley is under, it has a quaternary tertiary fill, is a, a broken down, more broken down material, and more loam-like, I guess I could say. So the, the texture is a little uh, finer. And uh, so you see some differences in uh, vegetation on those two types of soils. Soil seed bank is very important. Um, what's in the soil? You know, it, the seed has to be there for it to turn into a wildflower. Uh, I was going to mention that October of 2018 seemed like the entire seed bank was cashed in. <laughs> Every seed that was going to sprout did in October of 2018. Every seed that was hiding in the seed bank. The uh, interesting thing about that is, though, that later, you know, when those, those seeds came to uh, maturity, they uh, dropped a heck of a lot more seeds. So there was quite a bit of churn in the soil seed bank, I guess you could say. <laughs> there was a, a whole lot of old seeds that sprouted and a whole lot of new ones that were added, added back. And uh, if you remember the spring of 2018, uh, it was very, very dry. Um, but the fall with that, you know, five inches of moisture in October, uh, things like tomatillo, wolfberry, um, a shrub, uh, the ones that didn't flower in the spring, uh, which they should have, did flower in that fall with the fall rain. So it was weird to see the uh, spring and fall flowering uh, lysiums, the wolfberries, flowering at the same time. Now, and for the wildflowers, I'm not going to just show a whole bunch of pictures. I'm going to try and give you some uh, evidence of uh, how to separate some of these troublesome groups. Um, our main facelia is the two we have in predominantly around here, distant facelia. I have no idea why that, why that, where that name came from. Notched leaf facelia, facelia crenulata is the other one. Uh, one of the things I look for is the, the filaments, the, the anthers. The filaments are uh, short and light colored on uh, um, distans, distant facelia. The anthers tend to be blue to white, and the old corollas will turn blue like that one on the left there. And facelia uh, crenulata, uh, the filaments are long, they're dark colored, the anthers are yellow, so they really stand out. And the old corollas don't really do, do what the old corollas do on the distance, they don't turn as, as bright, as blue, I should say. Um, okay, now we got our bladder pods. We have two species around here. Um, Facelia gordonii is uh, mo what most people, what, what the uh, uh, default <laughs> uh, iNaturalist thing tends to uh, call them is Facelia uh, fi uh, Fisaria gordonii. They have uh, no hairs on, they have a glabrous fruit. If you look at the fruit, glabrous, glabrous, whichever, um, there are no hairs, they're just bare. The Fisaria tenella, which is more common, at least in the uh, in my area, in the uh, and again on the uh, um, carbonate soils, has these fine uh, stellate hairs. If you look at them under a scope, they branch. They're branched hairs, and they're very pressed to the to the fruit. But the, that's how you can tell one from the other. The fruit is glabrous, or or with those stellate hairs, and that's how you can determine one from the other. Lupins. We have several species here. The main ones are, the main one is the one on the right there, Lupinus parts of Flores. You're going to see that all over the valley. In the western and uh, southern valley, you're going to see uh, Lupinus arizonicus over in the white tanks, south mountains, areas like that. You're going to see that pinkish flower and where you'll see the blue flower on the, on the right most everywhere. 
both of them have an interesting character. If you see the, the center of the flowers on the upper part of the stem are white. Uh, and then below that, they're, they're red. The centers of the flowers are, are a different color. What happens is a, the bee will come along and, and pollinate the thing. And the, the little claws, their little claws will tear the, the tissue of the, of the corolla and release ethylene gas. And that ethylene gas converts that uh, white spot to a red spot. And it's basically a clue to let other bees know that uh, uh, those flowers have been, the, the, the nectar's gone, that's been used. So go to the upper flowers and, and, and try and find some nectar there. And it uh, you know, increases the pollination uh, for uh, pollination rates, on the, I'm sure, for, for bees. It, it uh, gives them a signal to, to move on from the ones that have already been touched. We have one other lupin in the area, Lupinus consonus, Bahada lupin, much shorter plant, very fuzzy, very hairy little thing. You'll see it in, uh, in uh, washes mostly. It likes uh, loose, really loose soils. Very hairy uh, leaves, a small inflorescence. It's clistogamous. It, 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 uh, it's self-fertile, so it doesn't send up that long, tall flower shoot like the other two lupins do. It tends to be shorter. So those are the lupins. Then we have our poppies. We have Mexican uh, poppy in our area, the receptacle rim on those. If you look in, on the left there, the one in the center there, there's a narrow receptacle rim. If you look at the plant on the right, you'll see those uh, receptacle rims are quite a bit wider. Um, it's uncommon here. It's mostly, it's California. If you see those, you know, you know vast fields of poppies in, on, in California, it's most, it's gonna be this subspecies. Our subspecies is an annual. It's very common. Um, you do see uh, the California species uh, hydromulched in places like uh, City of Scottsdale did Pima Road. They did they hydromulched with the California subspecies. And if you ever go out to Bartlett Lake and go north on the on the branch road there that that takes you around the west side of the, the lake, there's a lot of Californica, the the subspecies Californica. The Forest Service contracts actually. Uh, don't, I don't know how often, but every now and then they'll go out and hydromulch along the roads there and you'll get uh, California uh, poppies. You get other lupins, you get some, some things. Uh, loop, uh, let me see, what else do they have out there? Uh, delphinium. Um, gosh, other things. I want a Gracie E family uh, flowers that they, they, they seed out there for, you know, for the tourist trade. <laughs> and uh, so you'll see the, see the poppies out there. And there's a lot more color variation in the petals of the uh, Californica. You can see some white ones, uh, yellowish, you know, just peachy ones. All different color variation in that uh, population where they spray out there at that part of the lake. But everything you're going to see around the valley here is going to have this narrow rim, it's going to be an annual. It's, a, it's an annual plant on the left there, Mexicana, Californica, can be a short lived perennial. Uh, both spring flowering, obviously. Now we've got some delphiniums. We have two species that, that dominate in the area. Uh, pale face is pretty obvious why they call it that. The, the color of the corolla is very light colored. You'll notice the spike is the, the peduncles on the uh, on the pedicels on the uh, flowers are shorter than the one on the right, scaposum, which uh, has dark blue flowers. The inflorescence is leafless. Um, the leaves are only uh, you know at the base. The bus bare stemmed larkspur, so th that's one way you can tell them. I've seen them in mixed populations. I have not seen any uh, interaction between them, so I don't know how, if there is any. We've got uh, one relative of theirs, another perennial. Those were perennials, by the way. I should have mentioned that the uh, uh, larkspurs are perennials. There's a relative of it that has uh, regular actinomorphic flowers, the zygomorphic flowers on the delphiniums. Com, uh, very common. Uh, those on the right there, if you look at those leaves, those really aren't leaves. Those are actually bracts. Those are leafy bracts, but very well developed. Uh, the, the stem is, is reported as, uh, you know, a bare stem, but <laughs> those look like leaves to me. But uh, that's one way you can uh, identify them is that uh, that cluster of three leaves, there'll be three leaves there. It'll be, you know, uh, different leafing pattern below, leaf three bracts, I should say. I just told you they were bracts, not leaves, and then I called them leaves. <laughs> All right, that's anemones. We've got uh, our uh, mariposa lilies. We have two, again, varieties here. 
Uh, one of them orange flowered, that's variety Kennedy eye. Munsey eye is a yellow flowered um, plant. There is a wonderful mixed population. If you go out uh, to uh, Humboldt, Mount Humboldt, go out Cave Creek Road, take it all the way out, and uh, turns into Forest Service Road 24, you go up to Humboldt just before Seven Springs and take that paved road up there to the, to the big golf ball on top of the mountain there. Uh, <laughs> you can, uh, you'll see a mixed population. You'll see a lot of this and a couple of other uh, species of uh, 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 Mariposa lilies up there as well. I have seen intermediates, kind of an orangish flower up there, but not very common, not very often. But it's a, it's a beautiful display. Early April, I'd say early April is a good time to go out and see those. <clears throat> Excuse me, uh, chicories, desert chicories. We have two, two in the area. One of them very common. That's the uh, one that we're seeing flowering now, Neo-Mexicana. Uh, flowers earlier, March to April. It's a bit, uh, larger plant, the plant itself and the flower are, are larger, common in the metro area here. They're going to have short fillaries. If you look at the side of them, that's why I took the side pictures there. If you look at the fillaries on it, the, the green bracts below, they're shorter on Neo-Mexicana as compared to the ligules, to the to the ray flowers there. They're, they're shorter. Um, then uh, a little bit higher elevations, you're going to see uh, later in the season, April and May, you're going to see ones with smaller flowers and longer filteries, and that's uh, the California. So we're kind of surrounded. we got New Mexico on one side and California, and we don't have one of our own, uh, unfortunately. There is a, a similar plant with a similar flower, uh, Calico cerus. Um, I don't, tax stem, tax stem is the common name. And if you look at the filleries on that, you're going to see these glandular hairs um, with a, a, this stipe, this uh, um, st uh, stalk, as it were, with a big fat gland on the top of it. And this thus tax stem, it looks like a, they look like tax. I have actually never run across the darn thing, but <laughs> I keep looking for it. I keep checking underneath the, the uh, um, uh, chicory flowers, but have not run across it. And uh, I think, let me see here. We've got one more group. Um, there are several other species of gilia around here, but, but by far the most common are these two. A uh, larger flowered one is, with pink purple flowers is uh, Flavicincta. A uh, long, narrow yellow throat. You can see that uh, with the side shot there. You can see that yellow on the, both the ends, if you look into the flower from the top and from the outside, so you can determine it that way. Uh, the filleries are supposed to be glabrous or cobwebby. However, if you see here, there are some glands on those, on the filleries and even on the corolla tube, there's some uh, glandular hairs. And I don't know if that's from introgression or just, you know, a poor report in the, in the, in the literature or what, but uh, there are some, some uh, I do see some intermediates in these. Uh, it's, other, it's partner is Gilea stellata, a white to pale blue corolla, a little bit smaller, a little uh, larger plant. It can get larger. It's a more a wirier plant. It's got a short throat, again, though yellow. But the real uh, standout feature of those is those filleries. It has uh, glandular stipitate filleries, very strong uh, um, hairs on it, uh, very larger hairs than on the on the one on the left. And I do believe that is it. That's uh, a sudden end there, but <laughs> that's uh, I hope that helps uh, people to identify various things. Uh, you know, some of these flowers as you see them now. Thank you so much, Steve. <laughs> All right, we're going to move into the Q&A session. So we do have one question in the chat. Uh, is there a map for our area that denotes the types of soils? There must be. I Let me see, where have I seen that? Um, the ones that I know of oh. are not super user friendly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. Yes. <laughs> Lots of um, there's a whole vocabulary with uh, soil of soil types too that's hard that you have to get used to too. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, principally, yeah, there's you know the the big ones are you know you've got your mountain ranges which have broken you know uh, broken materials at the top the bajadas as you know the further away you get from the center of the thing the you know the finer the materials. Uh, so you got the mountain ranges that have you know rocky soils, then you've got that pinnacle peak pediment, the, the granitic material that's broken down, the unconsolidated granite, they call it, which is, uh, you know, Cape Cod Carefree, Northern Preserve, where I live, you know, but, but up in North Scottsdale near Carefree. And uh, that's that very 
large grain soil uh, that water flows through pretty regularly. Then you get your quaternary fill, which is most of most of the valley. Uh, most of the flatter areas of the valley is, is uh, finer grain material. That's in general a good map. I don't know. I think USGS, uh, Arizona, oh, Arizona uh, Department of, let me see, what is that called? The Arizona Geological Society, I think, something like that. I wish I could remember the name offhand. But there's a geological society in the state that I, I think they have some good maps, of, more detailed maps of soils. Yeah, I agree. I put a link to one in the chat for you, Anne. Good. It's a little complicated and it's kind of a sort of GIS application. So you can play with that if you want. Um, but yeah, USGS. And if we find anything else, I'll be sure to include it in the email with the recording. Um, does anyone want to unmute and ask Steve anything verbally? We've got crickets. Well, then I'll ask you the questions that I have. <laughs> What's right. your favorite wildflower? Oh, gosh, I don't know. Those Maripopa, most Mariposa lilies just jump at out jump out at me is, is you know the, the gorgeous deep orange and that bright yellow <laughs> those do and then uh, there's some other uh, other species of it that, that i like so kind of like those um that, yeah that's it <laughs> yeah they are so stunning uh and yeah. even up near like uh clear creek and at the higher elevations mm -hmm. there's some yeah. really spectacular i started uh kind of going on a treasure hunt to find as many different colors as i could <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, we have another question in the chat. What elevation do we find anemones? Anemones you're going to find in rocky areas. You're going to find uh, they are uh, a favorite of, of javelinas. So they get dug up and eaten a lot. Um, uh, one, one area, there's a little patch on uh, Browns Mountain. There's a little patch of agave uh, tumiana growing up there. And that's where I see some great big ones. I didn't realize they could get that big. But they're doing very well there because the javelinas don't want to go there and risk getting an eye poked out trying to eat them you know, with a with that shin dagger type of gobby leaf there. So that's that's one good place to look for them. But yeah, look for rocky areas that kind of like shady spots where water concentrates. Uh, so you know, along the edges of rocks, boulders, things like that. That's a that's a good place to look for those. I had no idea that those were javelina snacks. That's really funny. Yeah. <laughs> um, them and physalis, they like those. <laughs> wow. I've seen the Physalis, the, uh, the uh, um, tomato family uh, ground cherry. The, uh, we had a great population of them out off our back porch and the javelinas this year <laughs> just dug them all up, thrown dirt everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> had, had a meal of them, <laughs> of those roots. Yeah, they are in the McDowell's, Kim. Um, if you hike Adaro Canyon, uh, there are some throughout some of those trails too. Yeah. Uh, another. Um, Sorry, Granite but... Mountain area. Granite Mountain area is another place to good good place to look for the uh, anemones. Uh, another question: I rarely see glandular thread plant. Are they that rare? Any way to seek them in particular? They are kind of rare. I've, I've only run across them a couple of times, and and the one time I remember distinctly was at uh, um, um, Apache Junction. What's north of there? Um, the park there state park superstitions lost dutchman lost dutchman that's it the lost dutchman park there I, I remember there was a site there that we were studying and I, that's the one place i remember running across them so they're not that common uh for you know if you want locations a good thing to do is to check in the sign up and search for the population and then check on their interactive map you can see you know where they've been collected at least and you got to be careful with those because some of them will be you know it was collected in 1898 in Phoenix, so I have a spot right in the middle of the center of town, Phoenix, but, you know, it could have been anywhere in the metropolitan area. <clears throat> so you have to look, you know, for the later ones, essentially, <laughs> post GPS is best um, for uh, finding actual locations of some of these, but sign it's a good, good resource for those. <clears throat> well, we have a thank you. Thank you, Steve. And then another question. Have you ever tried to propagate Mariposa lilies? Not me, no. I, I have a black thumb. I can't grow anything. That's why I'm a taxonomist. That's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> I actually went to school to study uh, agriculture. I was going to grow jojoba, by golly, and you know, save the whales. <laughs> you were uh, a jojoba farmer. <laughs> yeah, I was. And then I discovered I can't really grow plants, so switched over. To, I had a love of Latin when I was in high school. The only student who signed up for third year, <laughs> and uh, ended up drifting into 
plant tax. <laughs> <laughs> Kim, you're unmuted. Did you want to ask something uh, verbally to Steve? No, I, I was just going to ask that question and I forgot to unmute myself. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, Lori, do you have any field trips coming up for us? Lori, was that for me or for Steve? Either way, we have an yeah. iNaturalist training this Sunday. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'm hoping to do a hike next month with Ecoflora. But Steve, do you have anything coming up that public can participate in? I'm trying to remember. Let me see. There's going to be something in uh, um, March. I'm darn if I can remember when. We got a uh, um, wildflower hike. Here it is. Uh, uh, March 30th. And uh, that's going to be in the McDowell Sonoran Preserve. We'll probably be meeting at Brown's Ranch. So that's uh, check out the, the McDowell Sonoran Conservancy's website. They'll they'll have that. That's the only one I have coming up. I got a lot of field work coming up <laughs> with them, but not uh, only that one uh, tour. Speaking of field work, how did you get started as a botanist? What are some of the first tools or resources that you remember using? Oh, uh, gosh, I was uh, living in eastern Oklahoma at the time, and uh, um, uh, so I actually took two years of uh, botany at the uh, University of Arkansas, and then we moved back here. I had lived here previously for many years, lived here since I was 12, and uh, basically here the resources I use now are, you know, I started with wet wildflower books and things like that, the, you know, Peterson Field Guide series, and, you know, those are the internet has uh, really taken over for field guides. <laughs> Cynet is, is just a wonderful, it's my second home, you know, between iNaturalist and Cynet, that's where I hang out. <laughs> so yeah, I, I guess that would be a good resource, Cynet in particular. And iNaturalist by all means, uh, sign into that and start putting stuff up there, especially if you don't know what they are. If you're trying to figure out what, uh, what these creatures are, plants or whatever, uh, take a picture, post it there. Somebody's going to tell you if it's a, if it's a you know vascular plant in Arizona. I'll have a look probably, but um, somebody will. So it's a good place to you know if you have questions, if you have a questionable question about an ID, uh, pop it in there, and uh, hopefully somebody will come along and, and name it for you. All right, we have a question. Do you take volunteers for your field work? They do, yeah. The field work, the McDowell Sonoran uh, Conservancy, they have a crew of uh, uh, stewards that uh, are, are trained in citizen science. They actually have citizen science classes, and uh, it's mostly those people that we that we take out uh, for the field work. So, if you want to look into that, that's a good place to to start is uh, becoming a steward. They won't let me be a steward because. <laughs> Uh, they can uh, put me on their grant applications as, a, as an expert instead of a steward, and I get that gets to get more points that way. So <laughs> I'm for, forbidden from becoming a steward. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you're interested, um, Lori, I would suggest checking out the Parsons Field Institute, um, and I also put a link in the chat to uh, McDowell's volunteer page. Um, and Anne, the training this Sunday is a combination. We'll be talking about the City Nature Challenge a little bit. Um, and then also we'll be doing an iNaturalist training, walking folks through how to use the app um, and things like that. I'll put a link uh, in the chat for that in case anyone's interested. It's in person at Papago Park. Steve, I have another question for you. In the time that you've been a botanist in Arizona, what changes have you personally noticed specifically concerning, you know, climate change and how our weather is changing and how some plants, you know, like wildflowers are generally responding to that? Yeah, just here on, you know, I've lived in the same spot for 35 years, 36 years now and uh, 37 almost and uh, um, have watched the changes over time. I, I do remember distinctly times when we would see the filleries. Uh, uh, you know, F-I-L-A-R-E-E, -E, not uh, the plant part, but the, uh, the, the genus, the, the species, uh, uh, the common name, actually, the uh, Erodium cicutarium. Uh, I've seen that hip deep <laughs> and not very often. Uh, you know, mostly it's just a little ground, ground hugging plant uh, lately, but we had, you know, such good rains pre-1990 is when I kind of dated is the, was when things started turning dry. Uh, Pre-1990, I uh, used to see a lot larger specimens of, of plants and, and uh, just generally more, more of them. Uh, red brome has, of course, taken over, and now we're seeing a lot of non-natives come in, like uh, um, 
uh, uh, mustard, uh, Saharan mustard. Uh, that's one thing I've see, seen come here. The grasses, uh, buffalo grass, fountain grass. I've seen, you know, just a lot of native Anka siphon. Of course, the stink net I've seen rolling in. So that's kind of what I've been seeing is a lot of, uh, a lot of non-natives doing well. Of course, you know, I'm mostly British myself, so I can't complain too much. Thank you. Does anyone else have, oh, we have one more. You said brittle bush does well after fire. Any other plants? Let's see. Uh, there are disturbed lands, disturbed land plants, what I call, what they call disturbed land species, things that like disturbance of the soil or, or a disturbance like a fire. Um, and brittle bush is a good fire, fire example. It's also a good one for disturbed soils. It will, you know, do well. Uh, in disturbed soils, Balia, the, the the desert marigolds, they 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 will thrive in disturbance. Um, number of other things that do. Um, desert broom, the plant city of Scottsdale loves to hate. <laughs> it's, a, it's on their noxious species list, but it's it's a native plant. It's native to washes. I think what principally drives them uh, drives it into the uh, um, uh, noxious plant category for the city is its propensity to burn, to carry fire, to block access to washes and things like that for wildland firefighters. It's the fire department principally that doesn't like desert room. <laughs> <laughs> That's just and wild. They have, they have arguments, yeah. It's such a great yeah. pollinator plant. <laughs> oh yes, it really is. <laughs> I, we've seen jojoba a lot. Jojoba mm -hmm. come back after fire. Um, yeah, I, I creosote think... bush, cat claw acacia. Yeah. Yuccas survive fire as well. Cacti don't <laughs> for obvious reasons. They've got their skin right out there. Um, yeah, let's see. I think uh, Ambrosia, Deltoidio move in. Yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll do well. They'll re recover from a fire. Anything that has a crown, any, any shr uh, shrub that has a, a crown will come back fairly well after a fire. And we have one more question. Is there any organization that is trying to exterminate Stinknet? And I'll jump in on that really quick. Uh, Desert <laughs> yeah. Defenders, uh, which yeah. we've collaborated with in the past, uh, is working on mapping and then more so we'll be getting into more removal efforts. Um, but check out Desert Defenders and I'll put a link to that in the chat as well. Does anybody have uh, any other questions for Steve? Hearing crickets. <laughs> All right, I've got that link in the chat. Steve, is there any last minute thing that you would like to throw out there? Any Steve, shameless uh, self promotion? <laughs> Not really, no. no I'll go through my notes here and I don't see anything. I think I got everything covered. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much for sharing with Wildflowers about us. Uh, I've placed links to uh, one of Steve's works in the chat as well as, like I said, the volunteer page for the McDowell Sonoran Conservancy. Um, these will also be included in the email I send out with the recording and posted with the video on YouTube. I've also put my email in the chat. Please feel free to message me. Uh, if you aren't already, follow us on social at Ecoflora PHX. And I also put a link to our event by Invent bright page. It's early in the morning, I guess, for me. I'll use that as my excuse. Uh, so you can keep an eye out for our other upcoming events like this one and more, which it's 1045. So I don't feel like being early is an excuse. Um, but I hope you all feel more confident in your wildflower knowledge and ID skills uh, and enjoy this wildflower season, even though it may not be a super bloom. Take care, everybody. Thank you again, Steve. You bet. Happy to do it. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, You're everyone. You're welcome. Yeah. Have a great day. Bye-bye.